Uh, shall we pray? In Jesus' name. Well, Lord, we want to thank you so much because of the teaching we have in this church. We have good teaching and we have good teachers. And you are the Lord that says that we should strive for perfection. We shouldn't rest on our laurels because the world is changing. Uh, the way people assimilate the gospel truth is also changing. And we need to find more creative ways of presenting the gospel to them. As we saw seen today about Jesus Christ using this innovative way of parables to try and get his message in, to make it memorable for them so that the fisherman, the farmer, the man on the street can understand. And even throughout the centuries, if today we can still read those parables and understand what he's saying because he's used stories. Lord, we're praying that help us to, to open our hearts today to be teachable knowing and to understand that we're not changing the content, we're changing the communication of that message, that the old, old story needs new, new ways of being presented to the new generation of today. Thank you, Lord. Help us, Lord, and use it to transform our teachings at the grass level and the point of presentation in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, I want us to open our Bibles, please, and we're going to read one verse, which is um, Mark Matthew chapter Matthew chapter thirteen, from verse fifty-two. Matthew chapter thirteen, from verse fifty-two. Then he said unto them, Therefore, every scribe, every scribe, every teacher, that is in, which which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven, is like a man that is a householder which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. Don't forget that, new and old. Who is the scribe? The scribe is, in those days, the scribe is knowledgeable in the Old Testament because we didn't, they didn't have printing press in those days. So the scribes write out the scriptures. They are the ones who produce the copies for the synagogue. They take the master copy and then they begin to write it out. He says, all those, do those scribes who are, and in the process of writing, they become expert in those things that if you say, okay, in Isaiah, if you quote one place, they can tell you the thing that follows because they've been writing out that thing repeatedly. They know their Old Testament scriptures. And if you look in the New Testament, you can see the interaction of the scribes with Jesus, how resistant they were to some of the things they were saying because they counted themselves as experts in the Old Testament. So Pharisees were scribes, but not all scribes were Pharisees. Now, every scribe who is like an expert in the Bible, in the Bible at that time, who allows himself to be teachable or to the, the things of the kingdom of heaven, these new things that Jesus was trying to teach them, will be like a man who is a householder, like a landlord, like the father of the house, who can go into his treasure room? So imagine a father of the house. He has like a treasure room inside his house. He doesn't keep the precious things inside the living room. He has like a room where he keeps like his trophy room, his treasure room. He's able to go into his treasure room and he can go in and bring something new. And he can go in and bring something old. Why? Because he's getting new things every day. But describe that does not allow himself to be uh, instructed, he will become a cake because everything there is old. He will say, yes, I'm an expert in the old, but he knows nothing about the new. Now, for us today, it's not about content. We're not talking about new content. The scripture is the content we have till Jesus comes. But we're talking about new methods. It's possible in this ministry where we be us, we'll be so gifted in terms of communication we know how to present things, our such scriptures were presented, and so on and so forth. If we do allow ourselves in this new generation, you've come to a new country, you are speaking not to the people of your, you're speaking to these young people whose attention span is not that great. And the teachers at school are adapting to them in teaching science, which is good, and teaching some things which are not even good. Uh, atheism and sex education, they're adapting to pass that message across to them in the community style. If we, you are teaching um, black and white and the people that are peddling false doctrine and uh, error 
are teaching technical law with uh, pictures and everything and parables and things that can capture the imagination, then who is the wise one and who is the foolish one? So that's why it is very important that we remain teachable. Don't say I've been teaching this out the scripture for decades. Don't say I taught it at big church. I've taught it in the big region, big, big group of district. I've even taught it at the headquarter in Bagada on the stage. And therefore, there's nothing you can teach me about teaching out the scripture anymore. You will soon become a cake, my brother. That is the truth because you have to move on. You have to know how to, so that you don't throw away the old methods. If it, if you need to pull out the old method, you pull out the old method. If you need to pull out the new method, you pull out the new method. You have a variety of teaching methods. And then you never become boring. And that's, that's Jesus, what Jesus is epitomizing for us because Jesus can pull out, you say you know how Jesus teaches, he will just pull out another one for you. And you say, is this, is this another way that Jesus is teaching? I pray that the Lord will help us in Jesus. For instance, Jesus taught not only just by direct you know, teaching and doctrine, as in the Sermon on the Mount, he taught with a lot of metaphors, similes, a lot of parables. He taught with he taught by example, you know, when he wants to teach humility, he's taught humility many times. He's taught humility directly. He's taught humility by getting down, take, taking off his clothes, put on a towel around his waist, and then washing their feet. He's teaching. He's teaching them. And he's doing this in such a way that would kind of grab their imagination and shock them to say, Jesus, why are you doing this? This is unusual. Why are you washing our feet? And he says, I have a lesson to teach you. It's a lesson of humility. If I, your master, can do it, then you also should be able to do it. So we, this is a, a refresher training for us since we have, and we need to, we need to refresh and then we also have new teachers joining us. So this teaching is the scriptures for excellence and impact. Now let's start off by saying the search is scripture as you look at this context, the, the context we are in, there's no one context for when I, for such a scripture teaching. You, you, if you have a big headquarter church, it might make sense to put. Sometimes it might make sense to put one single person on the pulpit to teach everybody, and then you give people, microphones to people to answer. Sometimes it makes sense in that setting also to bring them into small small groups so that they interact well with each other. In our own context here, I've been, I've been, as I move on, I look at the search scripture, I say, is this the best way of doing it? For instance, one time we can put one person on the pulpit and give them a microphone, um, but it depends on how that person handles it. It could become very much like a Bible study or a seminar. And I'm saying, when you have the space, pastors, Sometimes it makes sense to say, okay, you 10 people gather around in a circle. This is your teacher. You other people go to that room. This is your teacher. And sit down with them there. The teacher sits down. He doesn't have a lectern. He doesn't have a pulpit. He sits down at their level. And you really discuss this such a scripture. You teach it in a kind of interactive way. So that it's not 80% the teacher is talking. And then 20% is one person read and the other person answer a question. So there's a lot of, and the, the, the goal is the end, you have to focus on the end result. Which method would I use that will bring the, that will bring the end result? What's your end result? That people will get the lesson. I remember the lesson is not academic. Nobody is going to sit the exam on this side of the scripture. So that brings me to, if you have like seven questions, do you cover all the seven questions? If you know that we're giving you 30 minutes 35 minutes. Or do you come look at the questions and say, this one I'll combine, this one I'll skip. It's all the end result. You focus on the end result. And that uh, uh, let me say, a lot of responsibility is put on the teachers now. If you look at the new side the scripture volume, we are volume two. Go and read the beginning of that, vol the, that volume. When I read it, I said a lot of trust is put in the side the scripture teachers nowadays. Because Basically, if you read it, to paraphrase it, this is my understanding of my page, to say, look, teachers, you read this thing and bring something out of this thing for your people. That's why the booklet is like an, is an, is something that you read, the people read it, but you are supposed to bring, you are supposed to even almost produce an outline from that 
uh, booklet and say, this is the way, what I'm going to teach. This is the part of it that I'm going to focus on for my audience. And this is the lesson, and this is how I'm going to spread out the questions. There's, unlike before, there's no place that says, do this paragraph, this is a question. Do this paragraph, this is a question. No, they put all the questions at the back. And they said, do not ask all the questions at the end. You choose the point where you're going to ask the question. So that means that you could have a number of different churches under deeper life. And as you move from one to the other, it, it's, it, the, the presentation is changing. The message is there. But the teacher is looking to say, considering my audience, my audience are young adults. Considering my audience, my audience are youths. Considering my audience, we, 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 they are women. Um, and this is the test. This is what the Bible is saying. And this is the this is the key thing. And this is the question I'm going to focus on. And these are and this is how I'm going to present it. So a lot of response and a lot of trust is put on the teachers. Why, why do I say trust? It, the, the trust there is that you are going to do a good job. I'm going to do a good job. Because when there is no trust, we say you must do it like this. Because I don't trust. We, the, the mainstream might say we don't trust you. You might go and say something. You might go and do something. So let us. Give you the recipe and it has to be exactly like this so no but a lot of trust is and that's why before we select teachers they have to be of a particular level of people people that people that can actually they know the bible they understand the bible they're loyal to the ministry they're not going to bring something into the teaching that is from outside the ministry they're not going to use it as a platform to you know to just give their own uh, ideas and all their own thinking no a lot of trust now in the power is put on the teacher to the scripture teacher i pray that god will find us faithful in jesus name so how do we how what are some of the the tips i will share with us on how to teach uh the side of scripture for for impact how can we teach it for excellence and impact well, aim to add value. So the key things in delivery, there's the substance and the style. There's the content and the communication. The substance is the scripture. Is two, the Bible and the start of the scripture are fine. That's the substance. The style is how you decide to present it. Now, I'm not saying go off and use one wacky style that people will say, ah, is this deeper life again? No, you are trusted to act within parameters. But you, there's substance and this is, how do I break this down? What do I say first? What do I say after that one? How do I, how, how do I ask the question? How am I going to make it interactive style? Content, communication. But the key thing is that you have to aim to add value. The way the Sardis scriptures, people were expected to read the Sardis scripture before we come. Now, the vision is this. People should be rushing to decide the scripture. They should be rushing to get to church early because of the value Bra so and so or sister so and so is going to add. They have read the book themselves. But they know that whenever that brother teaches, he's going to add another value that I cannot just get by reading the book my own. He's going to bring that aha moment that ah, this thing has been in the Bible. I didn't I, 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 why is it that? Um, the way when he said it, it's just like I, my mind just went, aha. This thing is in the side scripture. I read it myself, but the way he explained it, ah, aha. So that is valid. And that's why side the scripture, when the ministry of a teacher is fivefold ministry, is given some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastor and teacher. Teacher, the ministry of a teacher, it, if a teacher teaches you anything, you have that aha moment that. This is the Bible I've been reading for a long time myself. But when a teacher takes you and takes that scripture, that you, the Bible that, not his own Bible, your own Bible that you have, and he's explaining your own Bible to you, you say, aha, that's a teacher for you. That's how you know a teacher. So our teachers, we have to develop ourselves in our ministry and we have to develop ourselves you know, in that calling that we have. Now, teaching for... for teaching the STS for impact. You are saying, how do I make impact on people? So that they come to church, they get something that they didn't get when they were reading it themselves. That's the ministry of a teacher. So I'm going to go through a number of these things. The first one I'm going to pick on is master 
your text. You need to master your Bible and you need to master the STS before you start. Now, in order to master your the Bible and your text, every, every passage in the Bible has one interpretation and multiple applications. So that means that if you look at where we read in uh, Korah, Jeta, and Abiram, that text, there's one, if you read the passage, there's one, there's one interpretation. There's not, this person can get one interpretation. No, there's one interpretation. Korah, Jeta, and Abiram, leaders, Levites, they challenged Moses, they rebelled. That's it. There's no two way of, that's what they did. Uh, 250 people followed them. Moses did this, he did that. The ground opened up, fire burned some people. The second one, uh, God said, okay, you people, you think you are the same with Aaron? Okay, all of you, cut your uh, rod. and Let everyone bring it together. And God now put a stamp of authority over Moses. Like one of our sisters says in the contribution, uh, if people are thinking, oh, did Moses choose Aaron because he's his brother? Now God is saying, no. All of you, which of you did your rod's bud? It's only Aaron. So that is, that is, I'm the one who chose Aaron. Finish. It, previously in chapter 12, he has done the same thing for Moses. When Miriam and Aaron rose up and they say, are we not the same as Moses? He's Levite, we're Levite. He's from this family, we're from that family. We even sing your hymn. We have even been here. When he traveled and came back, and God said, you, you think you are the same with Moses? Okay, I'm not happy. Miriam, you get your leprosy. So there's one interpretation for, and you need to find that interpretation. That's why, where is your, where is your study Bible? Where is your concordance? Where is you checking up and saying, this place, let me read a number of commentaries on it. There's no commentary that is 100% correct, by the way. The only thing that is 100% correct is the Bible. But you have people that have devoted their life to studying this thing. Hear what they say. You don't have to take it 100%, but by the time you compare a few together, and then you, you understand the doctrines of the church, which is like the framework, you begin to get a good understanding. If the teacher cannot get a better understanding of a Bible passage and of the sad description than the people, then why are people coming to listen to him? Everybody stay at home and read the sad description on their own. So it's like when we send our children to school. If you send your child to school and you, are, you come back and say, what did the teacher teach you? The teacher say, there's nothing the teacher teach, told me that is new that I did not read in the textbook. The textbook that we they gave us for biology, we go to the class, the teacher opened, he said, open to page 330 and was just reading from the biology textbook. What will you do? The next parents evening, you go there. You say, why am I sending my child to this school? When the teacher will just come and read from the biology textbook that my child has already read at home. You will not be happy with that. You say, why are we paying money to the teacher? But there are multiple applications. You can read this thing, you can, you can apply it in various ways. Once you get the interpretation, you can apply it in various ways. If you are teaching youth, the application of that uh, scripture might be different. The lesson you want to pull out and you want to emphasize it will be different if you are teaching women, to be different if you, are, if you are teaching children. So there are multiple applications. That's why there's no one size fits all. That's why as we move around, you begin to say, oh, this teacher highlighted on this. And that teacher highlighted on that. And it's from the same text. It's from the same side of the scripture. So God speaks in context. So work hard to understand the context concerning where it fits into the chapter and the book. So thank God in our side of the scripture, we read whole chapters, sometimes two or three chapters. But if it is just one, for instance, if you have a reference there, sometimes some of the references are just a few verses, understand how that verse fits into the chapter. But if you don't, if you have a text without a context, it's called a pretext. If you take any verse of the Bible and you remove it from its context, then you have a pretext. It becomes fake. For instance, somebody can pick, that's how false doctrine starts, my brethren. That's the original false doctrine. If somebody, any, the, the devil could take the scripture and say, he jumped, Jesus jumped from this high place because he said he would give his angel child of What did he do? He pulled it out of the context. Somebody could say, uh, he could just read one place and uh, and Judas went to go and hang himself. So, so does that mean that people should go and commit suicide? What is the context behind it? 
what is the context? What what it, what does the verse what does what's the verse preceding and following? What it how does that first fit into that chapter? How does this chapter sixteen fit into Numbers, the chapter sixteen of we read in the first story? How does it fit into the whole book of Numbers? So you need to find, and I will encourage all our teachers that if you are ministry, if you have the ministry of teaching, whether it's side the scripture or you are not even given side the scripture, but you have the ministry of teaching. You need to be able to understand your Bible. That's why sometimes you just pick number and say, this number, I want to understand it from beginning to end. So, because tomorrow a sad scripture will come. You might not have time to read the whole book of numbers, but you know, this chapter, this is how it fits in to the book. You need to understand what is numbers talking about? Where were they in numbers? And so on. There's some things that are quite important for us to understand. So, we need to, for instance, we need to understand in chapter 16, what was preceding it? They got to the boundary, they sent um, they sent spies, the spies came back, they gave evil report, and then after the evil report, then the hearts of people melted, then the, 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 the God says, you are not, your generation is not going to get there. After that, the people still say, we will arise and go by force. They, they, they fell before the enemy. After that, so you, you need to understand things by the grace of God. So, and it's all, it doesn't come from, the gift comes from heaven, the ministry comes from heaven. The knowledge comes from the Holy Spirit and they are, the, so you need to understand what type of Bible do you have, for instance? So if you have the normal Bible, it's your, your online, there's no study there, there's no, you don't have Thompson, you don't have Dix, you don't have any st good study Bible. You don't have, you, there's no concordance you are using, whether electronic or physical concordance. There's Young's concordance, there's Strong's concordance. There are many electronic concordances nowadays if you like using the electronic version of the Bible. So you need to understand, and you need to understand the context concerning your audience. So you have to understand, you need to concern the primary audience. So when uh, when Moses was talking, who was his primary audience? So you have to understand that first before you apply it. When Jesus was on the Sermon of the Mount, who was his primary audience? You need to understand that because if you don't, you might, when you are trying to apply it, you might get into some uh, misinterpretation. So in order for us to do this, you have to do what we call time travel. You have to go from the Bible days, from our days to the Bible days. You travel back first. You go back in time first. So you travel by, imagine you have a time machine. You get into that time machine, you travel back centuries. And then you put yourself in that congregation. So we're reading about Numbers chapter 16, the first study. You put yourself in that. You say, I'm an Israelite in this congregation. I'm a fly on the wall. I'm just observing. And I'm seeing how Korah, Dita, and Abiram came, came up, how they approached Moses, what Moses did. Put yourself in that context. Understand a little bit about the geography, the history, and the culture. Sometimes you have to do that. So for you to get an accurate interpretation, you have to travel back in time. Once you understand the interpretation, ah, this is what was going on then. You now enter your time machine again, and you travel back to today. And you now say, in our own geography, history, culture, what are some lessons that are transferable that I can pull out? Because the Bible is written for all generations. There must be a lesson I can pull out for today. So after you master your uh, Bible and the STS, you find the main thing that runs through the text, and then you understand your audience. So, for instance, when we did this uh, training a while back, um, we were looking at, uh, we just looked at lesson 861, the Reformation by Josiah. What was the main theme? Do you have to understand what is the main theme of this chapter that I read? If I was to condense it into one main theme, what was the main theme of the Start the scripture. You understand. It. So that study is to become a spiritual change agent. That's what we. That's that's how I. That's my, my how I just study. Remember, remember, different teachers might come up with slightly different main themes, and they're all correct because there's not one really main theme. It's like there might be three themes. I say, okay, this one is the main. There might be five themes. You say that one is the main. So we might come up with different things. But they will all be kind of along, they'll be, they will not be too far off because remember it has one interpretation. 
the one with the first study we did to the chorus rebellion and approval of Aaron's priesthood. Uh, the question I'm asking now, what is the main theme of that main theme or main lesson of that? So I'm, I'm going to ask you to unmute. I just wrote a few contributions. Now there's a hint I put at the bottom here. From which perspectives are we looking at it? So there's a different people. If I was a different trainer, if a different trainer was training you today, they will come up with they might phrase this in a different way. The way I phrase it, I, I like to phrase it from you remember the time travel. I like to phrase it from the present, not from the past. Another person can frame it from the past. You say the main theme of this of the, the main lesson of today of uh, lesson 861 could also have been oh king josiah did this king josiah how king josiah cleansed the land of idolatry that is stating it in the past what what happened we can also state it in the present the main theme because we i like to put it in the present because we are taking things away i don't want people to go with history lesson or Bible knowledge lesson to say, oh, what do you learn in church today? We learn how Josiah did this, how did I did that. Josiah has gone to glory. He's gone where he's gone. <laughs> it is us today. What am I going to do? What are you going to do? Why did God write it there? He wrote it there, not just to give me information, in order to give me transformation. So I like putting it in today to say, hmm, this is it. So let's let if you if you raise up your hand or if you signify they can put you come can come out of me what is the main thing or the main lesson of the study today if you like put it in the past in terms of bible if you like put it into in terms of interpretation or put it in the present in terms of application yes so pastor Moses, keep your eye out if we can find one or two quickly we'll do it if we cannot then uh, we'll move on well, to me, I would say the danger of rebellious. God bless you. The danger of rebellion. That's a good main thing. Thank you, Sister Elizabeth. Sister Donna. Sister Donna. Yeah. Um, I think that the um, main theme that hits me is fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. God bless you. And this, this, can you see so? Different teachers might come up with different main things, but that is the responsibility that, that the ministry is putting on the teacher now to say, you know your audience, you, you know your text, you know which of the 10 main teams or the five main teams you need to pick on. You are in England, you know the main thing that ha, even though the Bible is one, but the main thing that I want to emphasize for the people in England might not be the main thing that I want to uh, emphasize for the people in another continent. Because when I also, when I look, when I look at, I, I can say, okay, this one is more, because at the end of the day, there's no study that we can teach. We can teach one study for weeks, but we don't have that time. So I'm saying, in the time I have, this is what I think is the main thing. When I come back, if we come back to next year, there might be another thing that God opened my eyes to. So the thing that God opened your eyes to might be a bit slightly different to the other one. But take this away, please, uh, because you can put it in the past. Sometimes, if you look at the side of scripture questions, sometimes, so, the questions are very sometimes it's about um description and uh, what happened what did moses do what did the Aaron do those questions are good but there are other questions about what should we do so don't spend all your time talking about what moses did or didn't do and you, you don't have time for the other questions if i was to pick questions i will pick some of the I'll, these other ones about uh, knowledge what is the Sanskrit scripture saying about this? What are the five lessons that, um, of what are the five points of that we can get from what Moses did? If I was teacher, I would put less time on those ones. Those ones, I would just say, okay, can you give me, can you give me, that? fine. We're just summarizing the study. The application is where I will spend more time because that's what would, that, that is what will change the lives of people. And let me say here, we don't have to do all the seven questions in the Sanskrit scripture. I've said this before because the Sadi scripture has increased in in uh, in volume, and the time has reduced. So you don't have to pick, provided you do a faithful job. You, the teacher, choose the questions that you are going to. On one hand, I don't want you to talk, 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 and at the end of the day, just rush and say we have time for two questions. That is bad teaching. 
let me be blunt with you, it's bad teaching, bad time management. Because basically what you've done is a Bible study. That's what you've done. Uh, so don't waste, don't, don't mismanage your time and say we don't have time for prayer. But by design, when you are the, when you are preparing the lesson, you could say, this question and this question, I'm going to combine them together. This other question, I think, I think people already know. I think I don't have time for this one. This other one, I want to spend time here. So if you ask me how many, if you do out of seven questions, if you do five, I think it's good. If you do four and a half, I think it's good. If you are short on, if you have time, you can do all the seven. It's fine. Good. Okay, set clear learning objectives for the teaching. This is the teacher. Now, is this a big ask? It's a big ask, why? Because you, we're teachers, we're teachers who are teaching people, and some of us are not trained teachers. It's not as if teaching is our profession. But any teacher, any teacher, if the people in the schools have objective, the teachers in the classroom, they have objective, we that are teaching this everlasting gospel should have objective, which means basically have a goal. So say by the end of this teaching, I want the children in this children's class to know X, Y, Z. I want them to be able to go with X, Y. So have a few objectives, have a goal. Because if you don't have a goal, how are you going to know whether it was successful or not successful in teaching? So what specific things do you want to achieve as a result of this lesson? Remember, you have to, you are supposed to do an outline. The outline could be written, it could just be bullet points, it could be you highlighting the side of the scripture book and saying, and writing notes and I'll say this, I will spend five minutes on this, I'll ask this question here. It could do it the way you want. So for instance, for Reformation by King Josiah, the objective that I wrote for myself is that through this lesson, I want to show my audience how they can become spiritual change and agents in their own environment because the main thing was Josiah as a change agent. For this chorus, something, what I wrote for myself, which might be different from yours, is I want my audience to understand what rebellion looks like and how they can avoid being part of it, which Baraji did a fantastic job on, by the way. Well done, Baraji. And I want them to trust God to defend them when the authority is being challenged. That's something I wrote for myself because I said, look, I, when I was reading, one thing that struck me is the way, you know, they're challenging Moses' authority and Aaron's authority. And Moses went back to God and said, God, hey. Moses did not lift up a finger himself to help himself. He said, God, show the people a sign because today we cannot do the same thing and say, let the ground open. But you know, a lot was at stake at that time. If they were able to overthrow Moses' authority, that's the end of the whole of the, the nation of Israel. Israel that we know today that are fighting Hezbollah and Hamas, they would have gone a long time ago because there will be no Israel. And God was just forming them as a nation, and God was their leader. God was their king, and he, he was directing them through Moses, and they were challenging that. And these were people that they didn't mind whether they go back to Egypt. These are blame people that just throw blame to say, Moses, you have taken too much upon yourself. Meanwhile, they were also, they had responsibilities. So I, 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 my objective my person, the one, if I was teacher, I would say, I want God to, to know that when the authority is being challenged, there might not be pastors, there might not be re overseers, it might just be, you say you are a Christian, the Bible says this, that is nonsense. What do you do? You begin to fight and box and argue? No, you go back to God and God knows how to defend that, he, that authority that is given. He knows how to, to give people a sign that this is his word and he's the one who chose you. And you are giving them his message. Or if somebody's been, if I was teaching this to be to youths also, what happens when they're being falsely accused? Because the, what was happening, they were falsely accusing Moses and Aaron, and it's painful. It's very, and you pain Moses. It's painful when you have not done something. It, I haven't taken anything from these people. I don't ask them to pay me anything. I've given up my life. I've risked my life. I'm on the forefront of this. When they are sleeping, I don't sleep. And then see what they are saying. It's very painful. So when people are being falsely accused, maybe at school, what how do they act? How do how do what should they do? They should trust God to know how to stand for them. 
But whatever, you don't need to have one or two, it could be a few more, but you you need to have you need to have um a goal, you need to have objectives, structure and timing. So structure and timing, how do you break things down? Plan your time in advance. I have 25 minutes, 30 minutes. I'm going to, my introduction is this. Avoid long introductions, please. Before you even start point one, you have already spent 15 minutes. Avoid long introduction. We don't have the time. Just quick introduction. Bible reading, avoid, avoid long Bible reading. Thank God for our teachers today. If you have long Bible reading, as they did, Ask people to pick up because they should have read the entire scripture before. Just pick out verses. If there's one long chapter and you need to go through the chapter, you can use Bible reading, but it will take five minutes from your time. Avoid monologue where you talk, 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 and then ask one question. You talk, 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 and ask one question, and 90% of the time is you talking. But this is a tough ask because you have to balance it. They have come to get value from you as a teacher, but you don't want to be the the only person running the show, you want it to be interactive where people are hearing what sister so-and-so said, they're hearing what the other people said. So everybody's contributing something, but you are facilitator, you are taking to the next level. Devote more time to the points that will affect your audience and engage your audience for maximum impact. Don't let them be passive. Particularly if you are teaching online, it's more challenging. But even in church, don't let them be passive. Praise the Lord. And let me add one thing in here. You have to be conscious of the culture we're in here and the people. For instance, some people are dyslexic. So don't say, oh, they ask us to involve everybody. Uh, everybody read one, one verse. The brother that is sitting there, you don't know whether he's dyslexic. You don't know whether he cannot even read. You don't know whether it will take him. To, and you just put him on the spot and you embarrass the person. So you need to balance between involving people, you know, kind of coaxing them and say, oh, bro, Joseph, you are new. You, would you like to read this? If you say any form of hesitation, just move to the next person. If you're asking questions, you know that the person doesn't have an answer. It's because when you pick people uh, out at random, sometimes they have some fear. And that could be the last time that person will come to your church just because of that. And, you know, they, there's a grip, there's a fear of speaking in public. You know, you look at their face, you say, oh, you just move on from the, that person. You don't you don't um, put anybody under the spot. If you are teaching children or youth, don't assume that every child knows how to read. So you have to you have to watch out, please. I have to be sensitive. Start from common ground. So Jesus started from common ground. If you look at the way he spoke, he spoke about the things he already knew, fishing farming, all that thing, and he took them on a journey to where they are not familiar. So start from where, start from common ground. The, all, all good communication starts from common ground, by the way. Develop good listening, uh, questioning techniques. This is something that they use in school. You could use what they call the pause, pause, pounce, pounce questioning technique. So pose your question. Um, what, le what lesson, the question could be anything. You know, you pose your question, you frame it. Then you pause because some people need thinking time. You could give like 10 seconds. You say, I'm going to ask somebody in 10 seconds to answer this. And by that time, people begin to raise up their hand. Not everyone can think on their feet. Then you pounce, you, you now pick somebody. Okay, sister, so and so. Uh, this youth answered the question. And the bounce bit of it is you know, is a tech, is added into that technique where you are saying, what do you say about what? So in the youth class, you are saying, John has answered that question. And Jeanette, what do you, can you add to what John has said? Or what do you say about, or sometimes you raise some, uh, you no know, controversy in a good way. You're saying, because you don't want people to just be swallowing things. You want to train them in the act of critical thinking. You're saying, what he said, does it apply to all situations? So are you saying in every situation, this, this, this? Uh, Gina, can you answer that? You are making them think. And you say, should we make our young people think? Yes, you should make them think. Because if they are swallowing whole 100% what you are saying, they might be swallowing 100% what the teachers are saying or what other people are saying. So teach them critical thinking where they're saying, 
how do I apply this in this situation? If I was facing this situation, how am I going to apply this to this? How does that work for us in this day and age? So if you look at this technique, your, your students are not just having a one-to-one -one with you. So one-to-one -one means you ask A, A answers you. You ask B, B answers you. You ask C, C answers you. But you ask B, A, A answers you. B is listening to what A is saying. Because if they know you are going to get them to comment on what the other person is saying, they will listen more. They will say, I don't know if he's going to pick me to say what John said. What do you think about it? So it's a, it's a technique that we can use. Some takeaways, prepare in advance. These are the do's. Add value to your audience. People are coming to listen to you. Ask yourself, what value am I going to add to them as a teacher? Some don'ts. Don't read your to your audience from a certain scripture book. I don't mind little quotes. You read it little, but if you say the whole thing, point one, you read the whole paragraph and a half because you've never studied it, you've never outlined it, you've never written your own notes, you never said, this bit, I start, this is what I'm going to pick. You've never done your homework properly. And then when people know that you are just reading from the booklet, why should they come? Why can't they just read the booklet and, say, and then come after the side the scripture and attend the message? And then don't seek to show off or impress your audience. It's not, it's not necessary. It's not necessary. So we, st we stand before God. So in summary, Style develop. There are many. There are many styles of teaching. Be like this householder that is taught, is teachable, and he knows how to bring new and old. You 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 look at good preachers. You say, who are the good preachers? Uh, the good teachers. In this, you look at them. They could be journalists or they could be pastors. Or they could. You say, I like the style of this person. Oh, is I like the way he engages. You can pick something from that. You can look at people that do a good job. You can pick something from that. You can be teachable. You can adapt to people. You can aim to make people think. That when people come, I'm going to, I want to make them think. As I sit in there, I want to make them think about what I'm saying so that they don't just switch off. Um, you, you don't want to be somebody that they're just reading to you from the booklet. You ask questions. The person opens the booklet and is reading from the paragraph. If they're doing that, they have not learned it. That's the truth. So if they are doing that, what you need to do is to say, you now need to ask another challenging question that is not in the booklet that will make them, because if they are just, the truth is that if somebody, if you give something to somebody and the person just give it back to you verbatim, the person has not digested it. But when the person has digested it, they're able to, they've thought about, they have digested it in their mind and they've chewed on it. They'll give you back a slightly different answer, which is like a paraphrase of what you've said. Or it's, an, it's like an expansion of what you've even taught. That's the way you know people have got it. When they're able to take what you've done, they mix it with their brain juices. You know, they mix it with their thought, and then they are able to give you something that is beyond what you, you, you gave them. They have, they have digested it. But if you, as you give, they vomit it back to you. You give it, they vomit it back to you. It has not gone through the digestive system. That's the truth. So I want us to come out of mood and take this to the Lord in prayer. Do you have a teaching ministry? Everyone in Deeper Life, more or less, has a teaching ministry. Because if you are not teaching today, when it Deeper Life itself is a teaching 